All right, welcome back to the channel, everybody. Today is a uh, fun little brew day that's sort of themed. So today, uh, the day I'm filming, happens to be the day that the new Star Wars movie is coming out, The uh, Rise of Skywalker. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to brew uh, a beer with Galaxy Hops, uh, kind of in celebration of that sort of thing. I love Star Wars and I actually like the new movies. So, you know, crucify me, whatever. Um, but they're fun to watch and uh, so I'm gonna do some sort of Star Wars themed name for this thing But it's a single hop IPA all with galaxy, uh, which is also another hop that I have not used before So it should be quite a bit of fun uh, So we're gonna basically be going for something that's uh, relatively strong hopefully like six to seven and a half percent And really hoppy, uh, but the galaxy is supposed to have a lot of awesome uh, mangoey kind of uh, black currant kind of tropical uh, complicated and interesting flavors. So we're not only going to play off of those flavors for, you know, the boil additions, but we're also going to dry hop this beer with two ounces of it. So, uh, should be a all around hop fest. Um, so basically this is going to be, uh, kind of like a West coast, clean American IPA, uh, not a hazy cloudy IPA. Um, if everything goes according to plan, I personally prefer West coast IPAs to East coast IPAs. And that's just me. Um, you can totally make a great New England style IPA with this hop as well. Um, and I do make those, I will make another one later. So if you're into that sort of thing and not this sort of thing, there are other videos out there on my channel for you. Uh, but anyway, I'm actually now using this awesome new, uh, brew notebook that I got for my birthday. So it has a whole bunch of awesome sections in here with which to take notes and write down ingredients and um, just be a lot more detailed than writing it all yourself on a notebook, a uh, blank notebook, like I was doing. All right, so anyway, our recipe is gonna be 11 and three quarter pounds of US two row malt, a pound and a quarter of flaked rye. So we're gonna add a little bit of malt complexity in there, maybe some spiciness, just to, you know, I, it's not a single malt, single hop IP, it's just a single hop. So I am definitely playing with the malt bill here. Uh, we're going to do a pound of Crystal 10 and a pound of Munich Malt. Uh, we are going to mash this at 151 degrees, single infusion mash for 60 to 90 minutes. So I'm going to take a grab of your reading in the middle of that around 60 minutes and just to see where we're at. And if we're at a good pre-boil target gravity, then um, I will stop the mash at that point in time. For water, we are going to be using 76 parts per million of calcium, 28 parts per million of magnesium, 65 parts per million of sodium, 234 parts per million of sulfate, 100 parts per million of chloride, and 54 parts per million of carbonate. So in order to achieve that, I'm adding 8 grams of gypsum, 8 grams of epsom, and 1 gram of chalk to my brewing water. So this is going to give us a sulfate to chloride ratio of about 2.3. Uh, which is going to be enough to help those hops shine. So for yeast, I'm, uh, I am normally do USO5 dry yeast for my uh, IPAs and pale ales, but uh, today I'm going to switch it up and use Y Yeast 1056 American Ale. That is a very clean fermenting yeast that's been used for ages and it has a reputation of brightening the hop flavor even more. So hopefully that will work out pretty well. So I didn't actually make a starter this time and it is a liquid yeast. So I am gonna go ahead and do uh, two liquid packages um, and that'll be fine because I'm gonna top crop some of this and save it for later. So I'll get my money back. And then obviously hops, you know, that's the big thing of this. Hops are going to be uh, huge. Galaxy is a high alpha hop at about 16% alpha acid in the ones that I have. So we're gonna be adding a total of six ounces to this four ounces to the brew and two ounces to the dry hop. So we're gonna go ahead and do a one ounce first wort hop addition, which is when you add hops uh, to the wort after the mash and before the boil. So while it rises up to the boil, you're extracting all of the uh, oils out of the hops and kind of increasing the utilization without increasing the harsh bitterness. Um, and then we're gonna do a 20 minute addition with one ounce of Galaxy, a 10 minute addition with one ounce of Galaxy, and then we're gonna do one ounce at zero minutes and then I'm gonna dry hop in the keg with two ounces of Galaxy. At the end of the day, this should really hopefully be a delicious beer uh, that is a whole bunch of hop character, and I'm definitely excited to see how the Galaxy comes out. I've heard really honestly nothing but good things about Galaxy, and uh, most of the beers that I've had with Galaxy in them have been fantastic. So I'm really looking forward to the final results. Uh, so anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and add the brewing salts and a Camden tablet to my water. 
uh, and get that ready for uh, mashing in. Okay, so I am actually gonna be mashing in at my intended mashing temperature, which is not something that you normally do. Uh, so normally you're gonna reach a higher temperature with your water, push your grains in, your grains are cooler than the water, that's gonna cool the whole thing down, and the goal is to meet your mash temperature as soon as you dump the grains in or dough in. Uh, well, with my system, because it's recirculating, basically what's gonna happen is the system is going to uh, lower down a couple degrees and then rise right back up to the mash temperature. And before, in a couple brews ago, I had um, a brew basically where I dough in at a strike temperature and that started recirculating. So it actually took a lot longer for the system to cool down to hit the mash temperature than it does for it to rise up to it. And actually at the mash temperature I was using before, I ended up denaturing a good portion of the enzyme required to extract a lot of sugar from the grain uh, by starting up high and then going down low. So in this case, we're gonna keep the enzyme active at the lower temperature range and then bring it up to exactly where we want it for the single infusion mash. And that temperature is 151 degrees. So I'm gonna start by closing out all the ball valves here and turning off the pump. So that's gonna halt the recirculation. All of my water is at the same temperature right now. And I'm gonna go ahead and also turn off the heat. And we're gonna temporarily put the uh, liquid lines in a bucket here so they don't spill everywhere. And now, I'm gonna go ahead and mash in with my grains. All right, so now I'm gonna let the mash sit for about 10 minutes. That's gonna allow the grain bed to settle at the bottom of the mash ton, and uh, that'll actually allow us to get a pH reading at that point in time to determine if the pH of the mash needs to be adjusted or not. Um, once the grain bed is settled, then I'm gonna start the recirculation process, and that is going to uh, basically keep going for the entire mash. So uh, in 10 minutes, we'll take that pH reading. Okay, so at the moment for my pH measurements, um, I've been using pH strips here um, instead of an actual pH meter, but that's simply because I really can't afford a pH meter right now. Uh, so until that happens, I'll be using pH strips to check it, but it's good enough to get us in the ballpark. So ideal mash pH is about 5.2. Uh, and at the moment, this looks about right I think at least in the color I'm seeing in in real color it looks like it's between 5 and 5.5 so I think we're good so I just thought I would give a quick overview of my uh, recirculating system as it is now uh, so it is kind of running off of this little PID controller here um, which is basically turns uh, the heating element on and off rapidly to maintain temperature um, at a more precise degree than just this simple on off kind of element. So right now the heating element is plugged into that and the pump, um, both of which I can control via this uh, PID controller. The heating element is my heat stick, which I normally use to supplement the boil on my electric stove. And then there's a temperature probe, which came with the controller, uh, that I have basically in this thermo well, which is part of this T-junction here. On the wort side, I've got wort going through uh, my normal mash tun here. I still have the bag, and that is just to facilitate cleanup later, pretty much. Flows out the bottom of there into this uh, converted boil kettle here, which I've been using to heat the wort in. Then it flows from there, gets pumped up, and uh, travels through this sight glass here, which I found on brewhardware.com. Um, and there you can see one of the main benefits of recirculation is that you get a very clean and clear uh, wort in the process because it gets filtered through the grain bed. That travels back up through this T-junction where the temperature gets measured here. And uh, then I have inside of the mash tun a Blickman Auto Sparge, which is essentially like a toilet bowl valve for your uh, uh, mash tun. Um, and it basically will open or close depending on the liquid level inside your mash tun. So you always keep a consistent level in there uh, at all times. 
And I got a couple residual temperature measurement uh, devices here, which all nicely line up with what is being read off the PID. As you can see, the PID will maintain about a good plus or minus one degree. Um, and uh, that's really been helping my mashes out over the last couple brews. Okay, so at this point we have finished our mash and we did a mash out. So that means raising the temperature of the whole thing up to about 168 degrees. That completely denatures any sort of enzymes that are left in the mash. So at this point we're gonna be, uh, you know, whatever gravity we have from the mash is what we get. So now I'm gonna go ahead and start closing out the ball valves and making sure that uh, we get as much liquid back into the mash tun as possible without disturbing the grain bed and then we'll start collecting the first and the second runnings uh, from the mash and determine whether or not we need a sparge or um, how much to sparge with if we do. Okay, so we ended up with about uh, five gallons of uh, work from the first runnings. So I'm gonna go ahead and batch sparge with about three gallons of uh, very hot water and let that sit for about 10 minutes or so until uh, I'm confident that the sugars have been thoroughly rinsed. I just added three more gallons of hot water to the mash, which is gonna rinse off the sugars, but um, I'm also re-disturbing that grain bed again. So the wort that comes out of this is gonna be kind of hazy. So what I wanna do is uh, try and recirculate this for a bit while it goes through the sparge process, and hopefully that'll help clean up some of the uh, proteins from the mash. Okay, so at this point, um, finished up with the sparging process, so now we're collecting out our second runnings. Hopefully we're gonna be able to top up this kettle with about seven and a half to eight gallons of wort. And then we're gonna go ahead and store the wort in the kettle for a second while I clean the bag and uh, spent grains out of my mash tun there. And then we'll pump it back in and start the boil. Okay, so now we have uh, just collected all the work for the boil. We're looking at just a hair shy of eight gallons, I think, right now. So hopefully that leaves us with about six and a half left over post-boil to account for any sort of uh, absorption from hops and uh, from tree blosses. So hopefully that'll get us an even five and a half into the carboy, and uh, then we'll have enough left over to actually keg and properly use. So. Um, we're gonna start off with our first wort hop edition of uh, one ounce of Galaxy here. First wort hopping means we're going in right now, right as we start heating up the wort towards the boil. And I'm super excited to use this new hop spider. Okay, so here is the pre-boil original gravity. Uh, so it's about 132 degrees right now and it's reading 1036. With temperature correction, that equates to about 1050. Uh, so we're actually three points higher than our intended uh, pre-boil original gravity, which is a nice change from the last couple of years that I brewed on this new system. Okay, so we've reached our boil, and because uh, I added the first word hop addition as the bittering addition, we're not going to be adding any hops right now. I'm gonna wait till the boil is 20 minutes from being finished to add more hops. Okay, it's now 20 minutes from the end of the boil, so we're gonna go ahead and toss in another ounce of Galaxy. And we'll come back in uh, 10 more minutes. 
Okay, so it's now 10 minutes from the end of the boil, so we're gonna go ahead and add another ounce of Galaxy. And I'm gonna add this Whirlflock tablet, crushed up, and uh, it might result in a lot of foaming, so I'm just gonna make sure that I watch this carefully, just in case. Um, I think we might be okay. Okay, and the last thing we're gonna do is start recirculating the boiling work through the chiller so I can sanitize the inside of the chiller. So it's now the end of the boil, so I'm going to go ahead and turn off all the heat. And uh, I'm going to dump in one more ounce of Galaxy Hops. Now I'm going to start putting cold water through the chiller, and uh, I'm going to use that first hot runoff to uh, sanitize my fermenter. And this time I'm not going to let it overflow and spill all over my kitchen floor with like five gallons of water like I did last time. All right, and I'm gonna to continue to the recirculation of the wort uh, that's being chilled back into the boil kettle for a little while until I dial in my temperature on the, uh, the chiller output, which I'll show you in a second. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is start dialing in this output temperature on the plate chiller. So this is the current temperature of the wort that's coming out of the plate chiller post chill and going back into the uh, boil kettle. Right now it's at uh, about 85 degrees, which is obviously way too hot to pitch anything. So we gotta make some adjustments here. Um, one thing we can do is slow down the rate of cold water going in, which I've already done. But the other thing we can do is throttle the output of the plate chiller itself with a ball valve. So, I can figure out how to do that. Um, so by just changing the output there, we allow the wort to sit inside for a little bit longer, which gives it more contact time with the cold water, which chills it down a bit further. So basically, I can do that, or I can dial back my pump output here as well and that'll also further chill it down. So we want it to get to about 70 degrees before we can start putting it in the fermenter. And it's uh, about 74, 72, it's, it's pretty much close enough. So once this is down to 70 or below and it's steady, I'm gonna go ahead and start transferring wort over to the fermenter and then we'll be able to pitch our yeast in a couple of minutes. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and shut off the pump. It looks like we got our wort down to about 65 degrees which is pretty good. Um, so I'm gonna shut off the pump and we're gonna take our output here. And uh, we're gonna start putting that into the fermenter now. And turn on the pump again. Anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and aerate this by splashing it, get enough oxygen in there. So it's a little hard to tell because of the foam, uh, but uh, the original gravity sample is looking like it's about 1060, uh, and this is cooled down. Um, so we have uh, probably a potential of about six or six and a half percent ABV by the time we're finished with this. So hopefully uh, it ferments properly and we end up with that. Okay, so time to go ahead and pitch the yeast. I'm using two packets because I was too lazy to make a starter in this batch. Now we'll let this sit in uh, about 65 to 68 degrees for about yeah, two weeks or so. Um, but I'm gonna dry hop in the keg. So once we keg this, I'm not gonna carbonate it. Uh, I'm gonna add the dry hops first and then carbonate it. All right, so we're about 10 days into fermentation now and we've had a steady final gravity uh, for about three of those days at about 1.012. So. Uh, I'm gonna call the fermentation of this beer completed, so we're gonna go ahead and transfer it over to the keg, and then we'll add our dry hops and then carbonate. All right, so the day has come to keg the beer finally, which means we're adding our dry hops, and that's the two ounces of Galaxy. 
Um, and I'm adding these before I actually force carbonate the keg because when sometimes when you add dry hops to an already carbonated beer, uh, you end up with a large explosion of foam because so much material is dissipating into the beer so quickly. It causes a lot of foaming to occur very rapidly in, in an explosion-like way. Uh, look it up on the internet, there's definitely some videos out there of pro brewers doing this and seeing an entire fermenter's worth of beer hit the ceiling in a pro brewery is enough motivation to prevent me from trying to do that on a homebrew scale. Um, so we're going to go ahead and add the hops. Now I've got this very fine mesh bag here which I have sanitized. It's not totally necessary though. Um, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and add these in now. There are a couple ways to do this in the keg. You can either tie it to one of the posts and then cap it, but I'm kind of concerned about a CO2 leak if I do that. So instead, I'm just going to leave the bag at the bottom for the entire life of the keg. And we'll see if that works. Um, I don't know if some people say you get grassy flavors out of doing that. Other people say you don't. We'll find out. I've got a sanitized stainless steel knife here that I'm going to use to weigh down everything. And uh, that should keep everything down at the very bottom of the keg. So we'll drop that in there and leave it there. And uh, now I'm going to go ahead and transfer over the beer into the keg. And uh, I'll catch you when we go to the tasting. Okay, so here we are about a week after adding our dry hops. Uh, as you saw, the fermentation went pretty well. We ended up with a reasonable final gravity for what we expected, and uh, adding the dry hops went smoothly. Um, and it's had some pretty good results, as I can tell you. Uh, however, adding the dry hops did create a rather significant haze in the beer. Um, because when we put them in, and this happens sometimes with dry hopping, they release what are called polyphenols, or they're basically compounds that uh, enter the beer and cause a suspended haze. At kegging, I already had added gelatin finings, and that has not actually cleaned out the, uh, the haze in the beer very well, so I don't think polyphenols are very affected by gelatin findings. However, at the same time that I brewed this IPA, I also brewed an alt beer, which is a German style that requires a lagering period. So they both fermented at the same time, pretty much next to each other, um, and now they're in the keg pretty much at the same time next to each other, but because of that lagering period, everything in the keys is at about 32 to 33 degrees, which is going to eventually clean the beer out and drop that haze. But obviously, hoppy beers are much better fresh, so I'd rather talk about that aspect of the beer than, and show you a slightly hazy beer versus showing you a clear beer that doesn't have much hop character because it faded over time. Uh, and stay tuned for that alt beer video, that'll be next. So remember that I brewed this um, on the day that the uh, new Star Wars film came out, and therefore I named it something Star Wars themed, so it's called A Galaxy Far, Far Away. And it ended up being about 6.4% ABV and a good, healthy 83 IBUs. Alright, so as you can see, it's a uh, medium gold color. So it's um, somewhere, I think, around 3 to 5 SRM. And uh, it pours with a really frothy persistent uh, white creamy head here. Uh, I'm really happy with the head retention on this one and I think that's gonna be due to the flaked rye that I added there and uh, possibly the caramel 10 as well. Both of those malts are known to boost head retention ability in the beer at the end of the day. It's definitely not like crystal clear and as I mentioned earlier, that's hot polyphenols. So that will fade uh, with time and low temperatures in the keg. Eventually that will drop out. Uh, but for now, it's fine because I really like the hop character this beer has. As far as the actual haze level though, I mean, I can see my hand through it. It's just not clear. It's not like you can read text through it, uh, but uh, it's definitely not as murky or cloudy as say a Hefeweizen or your standard hazy New England IPA. Um, let's go in for the aroma now. So the aroma is actually really, really pleasant. Uh, it's a very refreshing kind of melony, grapefruity kind of aroma. Not tropical. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it smells more like a classic West Coast kind of hop. Um, yeah, it's a little zesty, a little peppery smelling. But yeah, really refreshing aroma. Definitely dry hopping this beer uh, brought that out a lot more. And uh, I definitely feel like that was a very good idea. Now for the mouthfeel and the body of the beer. It's got a medium body to it. It's definitely not light body, but it's also definitely not heavy or thick. Um, and it's relatively creamy. 
and you know it, it's definitely a slower drinker than I think your classic West Coast clean IPA would be but feels right um, it's very it, it's not silky like a porter is with a ton of flake drain in it which um, I think is the contributor to the medium body here um, and it's not uh, it's not light like a crisp lager, you know. Um, but just somewhere in between. And uh, it has kind of a creaminess to it that you would find in a, a New England IPA. And I wonder if that comes from hot polyphenols. If that assumption is actually correct, I'd be really interested to find out why. Uh, so if you do know something about that, please comment down below. Okay, lastly, my favorite part, and I'm sure it's many of yours as well, the flavor. Mm. So it hits you right up front with a pretty solid bittering. Um, it's very clean though, it's, it's smooth and clean, it's not jarring in any way. Um, then you get a lot of juicy hop flavor in the middle, and uh, at the end of it, it kind of transitions off into the malty flavors. Uh, so you get a lot of uh, bready malt out of this one, I think, um, on the back half, but the whole first half of the tasting experience is entirely hops, uh, which is the way an IPA should be. Um, the lingering aftertaste is a little bit of uh, just a tiny bit of bitter hop um, flavor, but nothing too too serious. I really like this. It's a very good IPA for what I've made in the past. This is definitely one of the best IPAs I've done. Mm. And I think it's one of my favorite hops I've ever used actually as well. Uh, it's throwing a lot of very serious citrus melon grapefruit flavors but not in the like really acidic way that um, you get citrus flavors from like mosaic or something. I would definitely take this over mosaic. You don't get any of the um, the cattiness or the pininess that you get from like Simcoe. Um, it's just an awesome flavor hop, I think. And based on the way the bittering worked, also really good for bittering. And coincidentally, uh, it puts off pretty solid aroma as well. So this is definitely a really good uh, all-around use hop. Um, really, really had a very good result with a single hop IPA using Galaxy, so pretty happy about that. It's definitely not earthy, it's not not too spicy, um, but it's got a little bit of spice to it, like a little tiny bit of like peppery type thing, but that's really, really not that, uh, that strong. Uh, it's really mostly those citrusy, uh, kind of grapefruit type, type flavors. Oh, that's where the spice is coming from. The spice is coming from the rye. That's that's 100% what that is. And I remember, I kind of, sometimes after a month passes, I kind of forget what I put in the beer in terms of malt. Um, but yeah, that spice is coming from the rye. That's what that is. And holy crap, does that work pretty well. I think I'm gonna start adding rye to my IPAs more frequently now because that actually adds a really interesting dimension to the flavor. I mean, it's an IPA, so malt doesn't really get that much talking time, uh, but that was a good addition. And not only did it bolster the head retention, but it also added a little bit of body and mouthfeel and that cool little spice note. So it's not really a super easy drinker. I mean, the ABV is pretty moderate, um, but at the same time, it has a lot of bitterness um, and a lot of hop character, which doesn't really make it go down super quick. Uh, but that's okay, because I like my hoppy beers to go down slower. So overall, this is a really great beer. Um, it is probably one of the best IPAs that I have made in a long time, at least a year. Um, and I really love it. I think it does exactly what an IPA is supposed to do. And therefore, I'm going to give it a good solid 9 out of 10. Um, I'm only going to ding it one point because it's just not classically clear. It's definitely designed after a West Coast IPA, so it's supposed to be lager-like clear, but it's not. And, you know, it's definitely not trying to be a hazy New England style IPA. I didn't add enough flaked grains for that. I didn't add enough hops, actually, for that to actually be a New England IPA. And that's a very different beer. Everything else in this beer absolutely meets the mark. And uh, so far, my family, my friends have all been very satisfied with it when they tried it. All right, so thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video. If you enjoy watching these types of videos and you enjoy my content, please 
Let me know in the comment section below, but also like and subscribe. Both of these things really help me out a lot on the channel in terms of getting it out there for YouTube uh, and helping YouTube promote it a little bit more. Thanks to my current subscribers so much for your continued support. Uh, this channel has absolutely blown up over the last year and I've been kind of amazed at how things have transpired. So. Uh, it's awesome to see that. It makes me really happy to know that so many of you guys out there enjoy the same stuff that I do as much as I do. So uh, it's really a true pleasure to create these videos and these beers. Uh, and I really love sharing it with all of you. So if you're interested in making this beer for yourself, if you look in the description box below, you'll see a complete breakdown of the recipe for my system. Uh, you might have to tweak it a little bit to your system, but you'll probably get similar results. If you scroll a little bit past the recipe, you'll see that I've also compiled a complete list of all the equipment that I use to make beer as of the timing of this video. I've also included links to Amazon where you can purchase them for yourself if you want to. Uh, just be advised that if you do click on one of those links and end up buying something, I earn a very small commission uh, at no additional cost to you. Uh, and if you want to, that's a great way to actually support the channel financially, and it means a lot to me. I really appreciate it. Last but certainly not least, if you want more frequent updates about what's going on in my brewing life and what is going to possibly be coming to the YouTube channel later on, uh, feel free to check out my Instagram. It is down there as the apartment brewer on Instagram. I tend to post to the Instagram a little bit more frequently than I do to the YouTube channel, and that's mainly because it takes a lot of work to create these videos. So uh, typically I'll upload a new video on YouTube every few weeks, and uh, on the Instagram it's typically a post every couple days. So check that out if you want to be uh, more frequently in tune with what's going on. In the meantime, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and finish out the rest of this beer over the course of the evening, and I will catch you in the next one. So, cheers. Cheers.